Oh, we'll get All right. Um, thank you everyone for being here tonight um, to our inclusive event where we're having an evening with Ms. Linda Taylor here, um, our director of special ed here at PD Schools. Uh, we appreciate her for coming in and giving us an overview on all of the different services that are provided uh, for students receiving special education services in Charter Spell, um, but also for just being here to answer questions and do all of that. Just because we're recording it and for confidentiality reasons, if we can keep our questions towards the end of the presentation, I'll do I'll stop recording at that point, and then we can ask questions and we can do a little bit of uh, mingling. We can get to know each other um, as well. But I should have mentioned my name is Jessica. Um, I'm with United Parent Council, so we're a group of volunteers from around the district um, that partners with the special education department, our um, special education committee, partners with the special education department to bring on these presentations. Our chair. Our fabulous chair, Deb Pozak, can't be here tonight. She was just in the hospital with her son. So she's hopefully driving home at this point. Um, so I'm just here pinch hitting for her. But um, I'll let you take it away. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jessica. And thank you, parents, for coming. I understand Jessica already asked, but most of you found out about this via the email that came out through the school messenger. So thank you for coming on short notice. Uh, we've been trying to get that together for quite some time now. And we finally were able to pull it off this week. So hopefully in the future, you'll get notices a little bit sooner. Um, I'm Linda Taylor, as she said. A little bit about me, I've been a special educator since 1985. Um, I've taught pretty much everything there is to teach. Uh, I've also been an administrator. I've got a degree in school psychology. I've been around this field for a long time. I've worked for the De Department of Defense, Indianapolis Public Schools, and I've had the joy of being here since 1998. So it is a pleasure to be here tonight with you, and thank you again for coming on short notice. Um, I know you all have children at home. My my presentation is not that long, but we have some time at the end for questions. We also have some time for you to talk to other parents, if that is something you would like to do to just get someone else's perspective. So thank you all for coming. Uh, I have some office staff here with me. This is Jody Haynes. She's my administrative assistant. She'll be our tech support tonight. And Diana Torres, who is our interpreter, who will be with us for a little bit longer just to see if anybody needs her services. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, they, uh, the flyer that was sent out was courtesy of Jessica and Deb Kozak. They wanted to really make this a grand event, which I was like, that's just silly, I can't. So you just get my normal presentation and you get my normal me. Uh, they wanted, you know, candelabras and things. And it's like, no, 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 no. We so, tried for a grand piano, but. But it is meant to be an inclusive event because so often in special education, we are not included. So we want to make sure that this was an inclusive event. So it was sent to everyone. So as Jessica just said, we've got a confidentiality disclaimer. This is being recorded and we do it live, live streaming. So we need to protect your child's confidential information. So if there's anything in particular about your child, their situation, your campus, please do not share that with the crowd. We will have uh, opportunities at the end to take some questions. And my business cards are also over there if it's something of a confidential nature that you're not comfortable discussing with me here tonight when we're done. Um, yep, that's that. And uh, our assistant director, Gianna Colonna, could not be here tonight either. She's out on a medical leave right now. So she's she's out for a little bit, but um, I'm sure she's with us in spirit. Um, who's in the room? We had hoped that we get some parents in the room tonight that could represent different groups. My biggest hope is that your parents are new to the process because this is kind of a soup to nuts, everything you need to know about special education here or the pre-referral process. So that's why we're here tonight is to kind of take you through that whole thing and some new district initiatives. So do we have any preschool parents? Okay, yay, nice, thank you for coming. You, you are new to the process because your kids just got in here. Um, how about elementary school? Okay, nice. I saw you raise your hand twice. Yeah. Uh, you got your hands full. How about middle school? Oh, we got a middle school mom. All right. And high school or transition. Okay, got a bunch of high schoolers. Anybody with transition? 18 to 22 year olds? Nope. Okay. Well, good. Then hopefully we've got a, a good audience here, kind of a nice, uh, broad group of people. Yes. So what is a disability? We're going to talk a little bit about that. We're going to talk in a moment about some of our district's initiatives to get out ahead of when a student has some learning challenges. What can we do before we automatically say, well, they probably need some special education. So what is a disability? Um, health issues that prevent access to the general education curriculum. So that could be any number of things. That could be a physical disability that limits a student from accessing the campus. It could be um, 
any number of medical needs for some of our students. They have uh, IEPs because they've got health things such as diabetes, uh, significant seizure activity. So all of that would go into that. Um, learning issues in areas such as reading, writing, and math. And we know that some of our students have also some social emotional needs, things of that nature. Um, an impairment that substantially limits access to the educational environment. That's kind of the heart of what we do in special education. If the child cannot be successful in the general education setting, then that's when we come into the, to the um, picture and we look at what is limiting that child from accessing the tier one curriculum and the general education classroom. And then last, a specific learning disability, autism, blindness, deafness, intellectual disability, orthopedic disability, speech, traumatic brain injury or TBI, or emotional disability. Those are all some of the eligibility categories that we serve here in Paradise Valley. Um, and we also serve the twice exceptional student. So that's a student who has a gifted identification and also has an eligibility with special education. So we have a lot of things that we do here. Um, often I'm told that we have the Cadillac model. I like to think of that in flattering terms, but I think when they're talking about that, they're talking about how much we cost. So um, it's not meant as a compliment, but that's, um, those are some big reasons that, that we you know, serve students for all those, those things. Hello, if you'd like to sign in, please. Thank you. So one of our district initiatives that we're putting out there to, uh, and this is part of Dr. Vale's strategic plan, is positive behavior intervention and supports. For our students that have social and emotional issues, or they struggle to uh, self-regulate, or they struggle with behavior in the classroom, this is gonna be a game changer because it's set up to be, have direct teaching and modeling of pro-social behaviors. So instead of saying, don't run down the hallway, that's not a part of PBIS, that's not positive. Positive would be walking feet in the hallway, hands to yourself, quiet voices. So that's, and that's actively taught. So that's a part of our PBIS initiative. We're really excited because some of our schools have done this for a while already, but with it being a district initiative, now all of our schools will be putting this in place. And I see a nod from someone who was a part of developing this plan many years ago, but it's wonderful for kids. And for some of our students, once they're upset, there's, there's no fixing it if someone starts raising a voice to them and you know disciplining them. That's not the time for that. So this is a way to get out ahead of it. What could we be doing instead? So I love that we're, we're bringing this as a district-wide initiative. Um, there's also school-wide common expectations for all students, not for kindergarten, not for second grade, for all. So in common areas like hallways, cafeteria, um, special area classes, restrooms, like there are really expectations for all of those places and it's taught. Now, back in the day, in another lifetime, I was a positive behavior and intervention support coach. And I coached a couple of schools in the district through this process. And I, of course, got the lovely job of teaching the behavior expectations of the bathroom to the students. Mm -hmm. And there's no easy way to talk about what you're supposed to do in the bathroom and kind of what you're not supposed to do. Right? Like we don't peek under the stall. We don't stand up on the seat and look over the top of the stall. So I had to make it into a fun little song. So needless to say, we do everything we can to get those expectations across to kids in a fun way, in a meaningful way, and with lots and lots and lots of practice. We all get better when we practice, right? So that's what we do with our students so that they pick up those positive behaviors in school. And the beautiful thing is, once it's been in place for a while, we've had parents say to us, my kid came home today and did this thing. I didn't teach them that. It's like, well, that's part of our PBIS model. So it carries over at home as well. So it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. I'm really excited that Dr. Bales and, and his team are bringing that for our district. Um, rewards and reflections. I'm not saying that this is all rainbows and sunshine. We're still gonna have some behaviors. Behaviors are gonna occur. So there are rewards for the kids who do what they're supposed to do. And oftentimes when you first start this initiative, it does take like a token system. It takes, you know, of course, praise. We ultimately want kids to do it because it's the right thing to do. And we just can praise them and they're good to go. But initially to get it rolling, particularly with the young ones, sometimes you need to give them a token. You need to give them a sticker, a star, something. So sometimes there are tangible rewards. Sometimes it's just the attaboy, good job. Um, and the reflections. When students have done something wrong, they need to think about it. What did you do wrong? What could you have done instead? And then we go back to those expectations and we teach it again. So that's a, beauty, a beautiful part of it. And then everything is data-driven. All of the decisions that we make is data-driven. I thought it was one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen to examine a school's data. And they had this place in a hallway that at a certain time of day, there was just always 
problem behaviors being referred to the office. So once we boiled it down and we looked at it, it was just a traffic flow problem. All the classes coming from two different wings went straight to that corner and there were too many bodies. Nobody was doing anything wrong. It was just congested. So all we had to do was reroute these classes down this hallway and the problem went away. That was data that we found in our system. And it was like, beautiful. That was a quick, easy fix. So we're excited to bring this because if, you're, if you've ever had your child at a school that's gonna make your day model, we know that our kids can go from, especially our kids that have some emotional uh, regulation issues, they can go from step one to step four in a heartbeat. Now they're out of the classroom, they're missing instructional time, and that's not good for anybody. It's not good for the students, it's not good for the teacher, it's not good for administration, because now they're gonna have to call parents and have a conference. So we know that these kinds of initiatives are good for kids. This is in many states, they have statewide EBIS. We're in the wild west here sometimes. Um, and so things that take a little bit longer to get here, but it's here and I'm excited about that. So that's one of the initiatives. This is to help our students with social and emotional regulation. Another one is our multi-tiered system of support. This is more along the academic side. When students are struggling academically, we don't have to jump immediately and say, well, I think they need an evaluation for special education. That's the last place we're gonna go. When students are struggling, we're gonna start with some interventions. We're gonna intervene quickly, and then we're going to put some interventions in place. What, what kind of problem is this child having? They're having problems reading. Okay, well, let's take a look at what those problems are. What interventions can we give them? Can they see the reading specialist? Can they uh, potentially you know, have a, have a tutor? There's, there's all kinds of resources in this district that we can tap into as interventions. Then we track those interventions to see if they're successful. They don't work overnight. Typically, we wait about six to eight weeks, and we'll have another meeting and talk about that. How did it go? Is it working? Do we need to beef this up? Do we need to change it entirely? So that's typically how that works. Again, the decisions are all data-based. So we're looking at the data. How are they responding to those interventions? And it's a team approach to academic interventions. It's not just the classroom teacher coming up with this on their own, which is a beautiful thing because sometimes, especially for our new teachers, you feel like an island. You're in there and like, you don't know what to do. You've tried everything in your basket. The kid's still not, it's not reading. So we need the help of others. So an administrator, oftentimes a counselor or a social worker, sometimes a school psychologist, a special educator, will all get together and say, okay, let's talk about where the student is struggling and what we can do to help them. So that's the database and team approach. And there's three tiers of intervention and it's fluid. People make the assumption that if a kid gets up to tier three, it automatically triggers they're gonna go into special education. That's not the case. The bottom tier is something that everybody on campus gets. So when it comes to academics, all students get access to tier one instruction. That's just a given. When that's not being successful, we put some intervention in place. Now we're in tier two. When that's still not enough, we pop up to tier three. But if it becomes those interventions are working, that student pops back down. So it's a very fluid process. Nothing gets us to the top and automatically triggers an evaluation for special education. All of these meetings and, and steps involve you. You are part of the team. You're part of the IEP team. If it, if it gets to that point, you're always a part of the team for your child's education. And I don't want you to lose sight of that because parent input is so valuable. We see your kid in a school setting with 25 other kids in the room from nine to three, roughly. And you've got them the whole rest of the time. You'll have them their whole lives. You know them far better than we do. So your input is valuable. Please don't ever forget that. And it's very important to us. So what happens when the interventions don't work? We've gotten up to tier three. We've beefed that up as much as we can, and it's still not working. Or on the PBIS side of things, we've put a ton of interventions in place for this kid. We've retaught, 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 and it's just not working. There's still no social and emotional regulation. That is when the team would come together. We'll get all of the interventions, and now you're a part of that team. You're invited to the table, and you're having a meeting about what do we do next? They've talked to you all along the way, but we get to the point where it's like, okay, we need to now look at the data and make some decisions. So in that meeting, you're going to be making the decision. This is not working as it exists. What can we do differently? We can do a 504 plan. A 504 plan is different from an IEP in that it falls under the Americans with Disabilities Act. And it is simply a list of accommodations. If a child has a disability, for instance, a lot of kids get them for ADHD. Kids are struggling to focus in the classroom, they might get a list of accommodations to help them be more successful. They can take a test in a quiet place, or they can have some extra time, things like that, that might help them get up and stand in the back of the room and move. I know I was that kid. So, you know, there's a lot of students that just have a 504 plan, but for some students, they may need more. 
And that would be when we trigger a special education evaluation. So we've collected all of the um, data that's been, you know, through the intervention process. We determine if there's a need to evaluate. So that's where we are in this meeting. We're discussing, do we need to evaluate and in what areas? We don't always do, it's not a cookie cutter model. You know, if your child has no physical impairments and they can access the campus just fine, we're not going to do a motor. We're not going to look at that. But if they can't write, we're probably going to look at occupational therapy. So there's all kinds of pieces that we can look into and you as part of the team help discuss, like, here's what I'm seeing at home too. And then up to 60 days later, the multidisciplinary team will meet to go over the results and determine eligibility. So you've given consent at this point in time, you agree that your child needs an evaluation. We identify the areas that we're going to evaluate. You literally sign it. And 60 days later, at the most, that's how long we have to do this, but at the most 60 days later, we all come back together again and we discuss the results of the evaluation. And if the student is determined eligible, we would determine eligibility. So who's going to be at that multidisciplinary evaluation team meeting? Well, you're going to be there. You're the parents. You're the most important. That's why you're at the top. There's going to be a school psychologist because they've been a part of that evaluation team. You're going to have a general education teacher because no matter how your child is doing, we need to discuss what typical kids, everybody else is doing at that grade level. Um, a special education teacher, because they weigh in with some unique expertise. A speech and language pathologist, perhaps, if there's communication or articulation concerns. <laughs> um, an occupational therapist, if there's fine motor concerns or sensory motor, that was where we get our occupational therapists involved. I'll pause, you're good. It could be the school nurse. The school nurse could be involved if, for instance, your child has seizure disorders, uh, has diabetes, things of that nature. Um, the school nurse may be a part of it if there are some health concerns or if they take medication at school. A physical therapist, if there are gross motor concerns, if your child is having trouble navigating the campus, if they've got some balance issues, we might bring in our physical therapist. And then a district representative. Um, that can be the school principal. It might be your school psychologist. Um, I could be there. If, if we've had communication and then we've talked about this and you want me at your meeting, I could be there or the assistant director. Um, so a district representative is just someone that, you know, represents a district and helps with that decision-making process. So these are some members of the team that would be there. I'm not saying all of these people are going to be there, um, but Deb, who's not here with us tonight, talks about when she, when her child was in preschool and she went to that first meeting and she walked into a room of about 12 people. I said, it's pretty intimidating. So those people can be there if there are a lot of things that we're concerned with. But you probably won't walk into that many people in your first meeting. So the IEP process. We, talk, we start at the beginning of an IEP meeting. So we determined eligibility. That last meeting, we determined that your child is eligible under this category. Let's say they've got a specific learning disability in reading. So we're going to develop an IEP. We may do it at that meeting, or we may do it a few, maybe a couple weeks later. But we'll discuss meeting norms. You know, how we, how we behave and conduct ourselves in meetings. And oddly enough, I don't see any up in here, but most of our meeting rooms, oh, they're back there, uh, participation agreements. But most of our meeting rooms do have some sort of agreement just because we want you to participate. We want you to participate meaningfully, to listen to what others are saying, to kind of take turns and be a part of the process. So that's kind of where our meeting rooms are. And then we talk about the present levels. This is so important because it's going to drive the whole rest of this. The present levels are, where is the child currently functioning? based on what we're seeing in the classroom, based on what the evaluation results show us, based on what you tell us, because that's gonna be the most important part. That's why I put asterisks near it. Parents' input. Again, you know your child in an entirely different capacity than we do. I was in an, an IEP meeting yesterday. It was very interesting because the parent was talking about the child they see at home. It was an entirely different child than the team was describing. And it was because we were using two different methods to work with the child and they were accustomed to what the parents did at home. We didn't know that, so we were doing what we typically do with the students, and it wasn't working. We were not seeing him produce anything. And parents are showing us all these amazing things, and it's like, holy cow. So it's really important, and now we've determined we're going to do what you do at home and get those same results, hopefully. So your input is valuable. We'll have the, the input of all the people who are part of that evaluation team. So if OT, PT, speech, if they were all a part of it, everyone gives their input. And it's a very detailed part of the document and it takes a long time to get through because we're going to talk about your child's strengths first. Everybody has a strength, right? 
even those kids that you think are little terrors at home and you can't wait for them to go to school, they have a strength. They obviously have a little energy and maybe some social skills because they're probably loud at home, but they've got strength. Everybody has strength. And so we start with areas of strength in all areas. So if we're looking at reading, writing, math, we start with their strengths. Then we talk about what are their needs? What do they need to be able to access the curriculum in reading? What do they need in math? What do they need for social and emotional support? What are their social and emotional strengths? Even those little demons that you send off to school, like, oh, thank goodness. They have strengths and we know that they do, but they also have needs. We need to go do some of that PBIS stuff. We need to teach them pro-social ways to communicate and, and get along in school. So that's where we look at um, the present levels of academic and uh, functional performance. And then we talk about measurable goals based on all of that data that we've gathered. Oh, I wish I liked what I'm saying. <laughs> based on all of the data that we gathered and we put into that plat, now we're gonna talk about goals. We've identified that this is an area of need. How are we gonna help? What are we gonna do? And our goals are meant to be very specific and measurable. They're meant to be attainable. They're meant to be reasonable and kind of timely because an IEP typically lasts for one year. So in that amount of time, and, and that doesn't mean that it's a, it's a set in stone document. It's always a living document. At any point in time, you can call an IEP meeting and say, I really think this isn't meeting my child's needs or we've set the goals a little high. I think we need to adjust. So it's a living document, but it, we, we look at those measurable goals and we try to make a reasonable estimate of how do we address these particular areas of the need. And then we determine the services to be provided. We've said that this is the goal. So how are we gonna do that? Who's gonna do it? How often, for how long? So that's the services to be provided. Um, does the child need OT? Do they need PT? Do they need speech? Those are all services to be provided. Then we've got some accommodations and modifications. A lot of times people confuse those words. Accommodations are just leveling the playing field for a kid. So if you've got a kid who's wiggly and squirmy, he can have, he can get up and go stand in the back of the classroom. For our kids who have some social and emotional struggles, they can have an anytime pass with school nurse or a counselor or a preferred person. Those would be accommodations. We're not changing anything in the curriculum. We're just giving them some accommodations to help them be successful in the, in the setting, in the school setting. Now, modifications is actually changing the playing field. Accommodations level it, Modifications change it. And now instead of being on the soccer field, you're on the football field. It changes what's the expectation. So for a student with modifications, if they're a fourth grader, maybe reading at second grade level, to give them second grade material would be a modification. An accommodation would be to give them fourth grade material, but perhaps to allow them uh, text to speech or to read with a partner. So that would be an accommodation versus a modification and actually changing the curriculum. So just so that's understood, and then all of these documents are to be shared with you. In addition to the really important ones, your procedural safeguards, which are your parent rights. If you've ever been in an IEP meeting, we always ask you, would you like a copy of your procedural safeguards? After a while, for those of you who raised your hands, middle school, high school, you're probably going, I can recite that thing because it, we give you one every time you come to school. And then prior written notice. The prior written notice is a document that's, that's offered typically a couple of days after the meeting because it takes us a while to digest all the things that were proposed, the things that we decided as a team were not gonna help this child, you know, things that maybe the team proposed and parents didn't agree with, or vice versa, things parents proposed and the team was like, no, we can't do that because, so those all go into the prior written notice. You'll receive that prior, and it's kind of a strange, it's called a prior written notice, but you're gonna get it after the meeting, but we give that to you prior to implementing that IEP. So after we have the meeting, we'll send you the prior written notice, we'll wait a few days before we implement things, so that you have time to digest it and like, okay, I agree, that's where we're going. So those are the steps in the IEP that you'll go through with your team. Now, in Paradise Valley, we have a broad continuum of services. Um, we start with resource support. For a student who has some learning challenges, we would start with some resource support. That could be a pull-out service. A student may work at a different pace, or they might need a little bit uh, different way of instruction being delivered. So we can do some pull-out services, which means they leave their general education setting and go to the resource setting or the learning center. And then we also have inclusive models where the special education teacher or instructional assistant go in and support students in the gen ed setting. They will still get direct instruction from the special education teacher, but they would spend more of their time in this type of a model where they're in the gen ed setting getting that tier one instruction, but with some help. And here's where it gets real tricky here in Paradise Valley. <laughs> and yes, that's, that's very small writing. 
but we have a lot of specialized programs. Um, and, and so you can see on the left-hand column, you've got what it is or the program name, and then on the right-hand column, the main focus of that program. So I'll briefly go through that with you. I don't know, can you guys see that in the back? Okay, and I don't, I don't need to read to you, you're all adults, but I wanna explain a little bit just for clarification. So we just talked about the learning center or resource, and that's for support in specific academic areas. That's typically you're reading, writing, math. Sometimes that teacher is also providing, providing some social and emotional support because we know our students often meet that. Learning for academic success. This is intensive academic support for kids who across the board are functioning below grade level, significantly below, not just like you know, the half grade behind. This is for students who are, are pretty far behind and, and they need really intensive support across the board, all subject areas, not just one. Um, and so we used to have that throughout the district, but we found that we weren't always raising the bar high enough. We felt like the students were always offered inclusive opportunities and we're trying to really capitalize on them. So we've made it more of a, an early, early, early intervention. And so we've taken it down now. It's a K through five program at this point in time. And we're gonna roll it down to K three because really truly that's where we should hit early intervention. So that's kind of a rolling model and it'll give us a few years to get there. But for our students that you know really need that help, we wanna hit it hard early and then get them out with their typical peers. Um, communication development, that's also doing the same thing. And that's for kids who have uh, speech language and, and social skills as far as social communication. Um, and academic support is also provided if they need it. For these kids, it's not typically the kid who's got a, a funny sounding R. That would not be a student who goes into this. This is a student whose communication so significantly impacts their learning that being in a general education setting is not possible for them. Either there's too many words or there's too much language, but there are students that really struggle with that or they don't process language the same as the rest of us. So they need that type of intensive support. Again, we're typically rolling that down to a K-3 because if we hit it early and hard, they should be able to get back into their gen ed uh, classroom by fourth grade. Connections. This is just a name. It doesn't really stand for anything, but this is a, a program for students who have social, emotional, and behavior issues. Um, those are on our comprehensive campuses, but we also have Roadrunner, which is our most, I should say, I should our most restrictive setting for students that have that type of a, a profile. These are students with you know, pretty significant emotional disabilities and Rover is all students with that eligibility and that are on that one campus taught by special educators. There is not access typically to general education peers. So for us, that's always kind of the last option if the kids can't be successful elsewhere, but we do have uh, connections programs on comprehensive campuses as well. They have interaction with typical peers because that modeling is important. Um, Learning for independence, we call it LFI-1, and that is for students that have cognitive, adaptive, and modified academic and life skills. So for our kids who have a little bit of a <coughs> more um, cognitive ability, they, they struggle across the board, and that's, that's gonna be a lifelong thing. That's not like they're just struggling right now because they haven't mastered these skills. This is, you know, they're, they're basically their intellectual ability is, is a little bit depressed. And so that, that's our LFI-1 program, and that's, we pretty much serve that preschool through age 22. Um, those are students that do qualify to go through school typically until they're 22. Um, we have level one and level two. For kids who are level two, three, they typically have some medical supports that are required. These are kiddos who might have some, uh, they might be in chairs and wheelchairs. They might have some adaptive equipment that comes with them. They might have some feeding needs, things like that, like tube feeding. Um, so our kiddos who have all of that kind of in a bump, they are in our learning for independence levels two and three. Um, pathways. This is a really exciting program. These are for our post-secondary kids. So once you get to 12th grade, and now, you know, we, we think we haven't quite gotten them ready for life. They get to go into our transition programs or our pathway programs. And we call it pathways just because it's a nice way to describe what it is. It's a pathway to living independently as independently as each individual can. So, should have fun back there. Um, so that is, uh, we have been housed at several campuses. And a really neat thing that I don't believe I have in here, but for our students that are in our pathways programs, they have this wonderful opportunity to apply for Project Search. Project Search is a very small program. We have partnered with Mayo uh, Clinic, and it's an international program, truly, Project Search. But we just have a little tiny partnership with Mayo Clinic. And each year we have, well, this is our first year. We're really excited to say we have 12 students that have applied, they've interviewed, and they've been accepted, and they do three internships at Mayo. The expectation at the end of it is not that they're going to work at Mayo, 
That is not our expectation. Our expectation is that they will have the ability to seek gainful employment and be employed at the end. The beautiful news is um, our kids are getting hired at May. They have created jobs for our kids. And it's really exciting. We just, we've only been in this week. You know, sometimes you just have bad luck. We talked about this, talked about it, talked about it. We were launching in 2020. And then y'all know what happened, right? Yeah. Along comes COVID. And so our first year that we're supposed to go marching onto a clinic, we've got COVID. Well, we went in anyway. We decided, you know what? There's no time like the present. They've got a classroom that's separate. They will mask up. We'll do what we need to do. We'll follow all the protocols. And we went in. And that was a class of eight that year. Of those eight, six got jobs right away. The other two have now found employment, but two of them actually got hired at Mayo. And that was exciting. The next year, we go up to 10 students. And of the 10, I believe eight got hired at Mayo. And so they've created some positions that for us are just so exciting. They're really opening doors for our kids to, I mean, for students who have some of these fairly significant disabilities, these kids are working at Mayo Clinic. Like what a proud moment for some parents who thought that their child may never even have a job. So it's it's a point of pride for us and, and it's very exciting stuff. So I can talk about it forever, but I won't. Um, so we'll move on. Um, structured level two. This is for students who have typically have autism and the level two students, they need a lot of um, life skills. They need a lot of communication help. And so that's our structured level two. We have structured level one. And that's for students who need some academic and social support. Um, and, and they also, you know, communication is kind of challenging for those kiddos, but they, they're actually doing a lot more academics. They're, they're doing a lot more group projects and things like that. Um, and now it's twice exceptional. Oh, it wasn't here. Good. Uh, right now it's grades one through three. That's a kind of a collaboration between uh, special education and our gifted department. For a student to qualify for a twice exceptional program, they have to have a gifted eligibility but also are qualified for gifted and also have a special education eligibility. So that's, we're, we're pretty unique in that most public school districts don't have this, um, but it's a tiny program. So I, it's just a little thinky slide at the bottom because it's only serves a couple of grades and it's on one campus. So that's kind of a, an overview of our specialized programs here in PD. So thank you for coming. Thank you for your time. And as I promised, my presentation was pretty short to give you time for generic types of questions. And then if you wanted to talk to other parents about like, what have you 